recording. So hello, welcome to week number eight. We are now in lecture number 14 because we didn't have one last time. Baby David's first meltdown. <laughs> oh, thank you. Wait, is that not me? Anyways, so we're gonna start by sharing the screen. Everyone should have section chapter 10 open. And the goal today is to talk about displaying quantitative data. There's two types of data. There's categorical and there's quantitative. Categorical data, if you can guess, this is a tough one, but categorical data deals with um, data that fits into categories like gender, religion, language at home, country of birth. These are not numerical in nature. These are categorical. There's categories. Eye color is a category. Um, I mean, there's not many things that are categories. And then there's quantitative data. Quantitative data is things like ages, heights, income, scores, GPAs. Basically, they're things that take on numerical values, but it's a little, a little more complicated than that. And it's important to understand the distinction. Just because something involves numbers does not automatically make it quantitative data. You have to be able to do math for it to make sense. In other words, I have to be able to average two values and have that make sense. If one family has three kids and one family has five kids, then on the average, they have four kids per family. Perfectly reasonable. If I have all these different heights and I say, what's the average height? You can average them and divide by how many. Perfectly reasonable. Can anybody think of something involving numbers where averaging does not make sense. Something in your daily life that you probably deal with on a semi-regular basis. I'm not saying it's on the forefront every day of your life, but you know something that pops up regularly involving numbers that is not numerical, is not quantitative, where averaging makes no sense. Can anyone think of one? Would it be like time? What do you mean by time? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just asking for clarification. There's no clarification. Never mind. Or do you, um, or do you, or do you need more time? <laughs> I saw yeah, I, more I, time. Uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty sure time would be numerical. If it took one person eight hours to do a task and someone else six hours to do a task, then on the average, it takes them seven hours to do a task. That's that's very, very familiar and, and, and perfectly acceptable. So anyone have anything else? Something involving time, sorry, something involving numbers that's not numerical? <clears throat> David, where do you live? Sorry, Conoco Park. Okay, what's your zip code there? Uh, 91303. That's... 913, because my zip code is 91405, which means someone who lives halfway between us should have a zip code that's like halfway in between our zip codes, right? In theory, but it's not always set that way. Why not? Because every city or every zip code is different. It could be miles away. So does it make sense to average zip codes? Negative. Negative. Zip codes are an example of something involving numbers for which it is not quantitative data. It is categorical data. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me. The average of zip codes makes no sense. You can't say, oh, well, if you're in zip code and he's in that zip code, then on the average, they're over here. It just doesn't make sense at all. Phone numbers makes no sense. What's the average of our two phone numbers? Does that seem like a, uh, something that makes any sense at all? Or social security numbers. Social security numbers. Again, it makes no sense to average social security numbers. There's no, I mean, I'm sure there's a, 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 a rhyme or reason behind social security numbers, but averaging them makes no sense. So this section is about quantitative data. It's about data where averaging them does make sense. Now, just as an aside, categorical data 
is usually displayed in one of two types of picture forms, either a bar graph or a pie chart. Those are the standard um, representations. But what we're doing in this section is about quantitative data. And the question is, how do we display quantitative data? So quantitative data usually comes in a number of, of formats, um, dot plots, histograms, and box plots are the three standard forms of displaying quantitative data, dot plots, histograms, box plots. So let's take a look at a dot plot. So here we have a display. It displays the saturated fat content in 69 fast food hamburgers. The data were collected in January 2017 from online nutritional information provided by the fast food restaurant chains. So here in front of us, we have a dot plot. Why do you think they're called dot plots? This is a tough one, but why do you think they're called dot plots? Um, I'm gonna take a guess here. Do you plot the dot? Crazy, right? You plot them as dots. That's so anti-intuitive, right? Brilliant, right? Brilliant. So literally, how did you know that? I know, I know. It just staggers the imagination. That's all I can say. Just amazing. So if you look for this example, um, we have how many dots are going to be in the picture? Don't actually count them because I basically told you. How many are in the picture? 69. 69, right? There's 69 dots for the 69 different fast food restaurant chains, correct? So how many of those hamburgers had 15 grams of saturated fat? 69. No, there's 59 hamburgers altogether. But how many of them had 15 grams? Four, four dots. Right, the four dots at 15 the grams. 15. Sorry? The four dots that are right above the 15. Represent the fact that there is four hamburgers that had 15 grams of saturated fat. And five hamburgers had 14 grams of saturated fat and so on. Make sense? Now the supersonic burger had the most saturated fat. How many grams of saturated fat did it have? Thirty-five grams. Thirty-five grams. That's this dot over here. A McDonald's hamburger has the least. How many grams of saturated fat did a McDonald's hamburger have? Two. It looks like this is one, right? Five, four, three, maybe even two. I, the formatting's a little off. It's kind of hard to see. Two or one, probably. Okay. Um, the In-N-Out burger has five grams of saturated fats. Circle I have a question. Yes. The supersonic burger that it had the most saturated fat, did we put 35 because it was at the end? Well, you put 35 because this is the dot that must be represented by supersonic hamburger. Why can't five be represented by that? Because they told me that it's the one with the most saturated fat. Oh, okay. So this dot okay. must be that one. Okay. Correct? Yes. So it's a circle of dot that might represent the in and out hamburger. How many choices do we have for which one might have been the, the in and out burger? Five. Three. One choice, right? The five dots above the five. So it could have been- five to 30? No, no, any one of these five. They told me that the in and out burger had five grams of saturated fat. This is the five gram column. Those are the burgers that had five grams. So I don't know which one of these is the in and out burger, but it could be any one of these five, depending on you know which one I did first. Does that make sense? Yes. So once I'm just processing 69 places. Right. Five have, no, the in and out burger is, okay. There's five of them that have five grams, right? Right. So the In-N-Out Burger is one of these five. Okay. Okay. 
what percentage of the burgers would keep a person under the government's recommendation of less than 20 grams of saturated fat if they also ordered small fries, which have about five grams of saturated fat? So if the fries have five grams of saturated fat and they got to stay under 20, then what's the most that their hamburger can have? 15 grams. 15 grams. So when they say what percentage of hamburgers uh, would have that, it's just going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 10, 14, 17, 19, 20, 24, 25, 27, 37, 41. Everything under 15. Right. So, 15 and under. Right. So 44 of the 69 hamburgers would qualify. So 44 over 69 is about 64 and a half percent. Did I do that right? Oh, 63 and a half. I was so close. Oh, I'm so ashamed. But it's okay. I still feel pretty good. So oh, thank you, Angela. Oh, thank you. Okay. So that was a dot plot. So here we have a experiment. It says a fifth grade class of 27 students conducted a ruler drop experiment where you drop the ruler and then you grab onto it and it measures your reaction time, right? The higher up on the ruler you, you grasp, the better your reaction time. So one student made this dot plot. They used X's instead of dots, which is totally fine. But one student made this dot plot of the student's reaction time in centimeters. So what appears to be the student's procedure? What did the student do to make this dot plot? <clears throat> Everybody a dot, all 27 students each get a, an X. Okay. And then this three goes on the whole thing. Oh, and then apparently. Oh, I'm sorry, Lauren. No, go ahead. I don't know. No, keep going. <laughs> I don't want to monopolize. Hey, it's your birthday. You monopolize all you want. You get this it's one over. time a year. Oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. It's never over in my heart, Lori. <laughs> oh, but Lori, today's your unbirthday, which is almost as good. <laughs> um, um, go oh, I was just going to say the numbers on the bottom are out of order. So I think every time they like did the experiment, they like put what they measured. So they just have to think that. Probably, which means the very first student probably grabbed it at what point? Six centimeters. The second student at what point? 19. 19. The third student at what point? 16. Fourth student at what point? 17. Ah, that was a trick question. You don't know that. Could have also been 16. Yeah. Was for, all we, for all we know, this was the fourth oh, one, right? Oh, good one. Right? So first, second, yeah. third. But after that, we're not sure. Of course, this one is certainly, well, we don't know after that at all, right? The 16th could have been any one of the ones after that. But this is not a good dot plot because a dot plot should be on a nice scale, lowest to highest, correct? So if I were to redo this dot plot, what would I do? Maybe put the numbers in order. Yeah, would certainly put numbers in order. That's basically the whole idea, right? Is so the lowest, the, the lowest number is four. Right, the lowest number is four. And then we have a five. Now, how many fours are there? Huh? Two fours. Isn't there's a one all the way to the right? Oh, hello, there's a one. Okay. And so on. Can we have show and tell next week? I guess it depends what you want to show and tell. I mean, uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, I mean, I, you know, Sounds fun. It, it might be, it could also be very destructive. I don't know. So it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Okay. Anywho, uh, I'm going to clear these. Hopefully there's no questions on it and we will move on to the next type of visual display called a histogram. So <clears throat> Usually with a, with a histic, I want, I'm with my family and I want to show my uncle he's crazy smart. <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah, we need practice at this because um, I have no idea what a show and tell might entail. All right, so a histogram is what you do in a situation where the data set is so large that it would just take too long to make dots for everything. Plus, even with dots, you want the height of the columns to be representative of which one occurred more. And unless you can space them out perfectly evenly, it's going to be quite difficult. So what we do in a histogram is very similar to a dot plot. But what we do instead is we group numbers together in a single bar. So rather than looking at every single data point individually, we group them together. So if you look at this histogram in front of us, what you see is that here's 0. Halfway between 0 and 10 is 5. So halfway in between that would be two and a half. So each bar groups together any burger that falls within 2.5 grams. In other words, anything between 2.5 and 5 would fall. And there's eight of them in that bar. And between 5 and 7.5, there looks like there's 11 of them, or maybe, yeah, 11 of them in that bar and so on. So what is the one major disadvantage of having a histogram versus a dot plot. There is one disadvantage. That's not the reason. Um, I mean, it's good to know, but it's not the reason. What is the one major disadvantage of a dot plot, of a histogram over a dot plot? Is it you don't know the individual like scores of each? That's exactly it, person? right? You lose, you lose a little bit of information where you do not know the actual scores. So yeah, boom, shakalaka. That's what I'm talking about, right? Wait, so, can you explain that a little bit, a little more? Sure. Look at this bar here, which is the 2.5 to 5 bar. There's eight data points, whatever they are. I don't think this is the same example as the last one, but there's eight data points that fall between 2.5 and 5. Lori, where exactly do they fall in between 2.5 and 5? Eight. Now, there's eight of them. But where are those actual values? Eight tells me how many I have. Oh. Eight between 2.5 and 5. But what are the actual values? Answer, I don't know. There's no way of knowing. Oh. A dot plot. That was a trick question. It was a trick question. A You're dot talking about the horizontal line, right? You can't, you don't know. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's this is 2.5 and this is 5. I don't know where in between those eight. Yeah, formed. okay. Or those 11. All right, those sorry. <laughs> Lost it there for a minute. I don't think, I don't approve of what? Or the other David, which one are you talking about? <clears throat> Speak sense. Professor, I still don't get it. Can you please explain it again? Which part? Uh, how you got 2.5 and the, the part, just all of it. <laughs> Well, if I look at the num oops, if I look at the numbers that, uh, yeah, the histogram, they do have to be touching. That does matter. They do have to be touching. So if you look at the numbers here, right, you can see that they are equal. They have they're equally spaced, which means that those numbers are two point five five and seven point five. Correct. Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, which means that if I look in the first bar, which is from 2.5 to five, there's a total of eight objects, whatever we're looking at, eight objects that fall in this region. The height of the bar represents how many I have. So I have eight objects between 2.5 and five. But I have no idea where between 2.5 and 5 they are. The dot plot would tell me exactly where they are. The histogram does not. What the histogram gives me instead is just a frequency or the count of how many are in each bar. Of course, one thing you have to ask is what if it lands exactly at 5 on the dot? Do we put that in the left bar or do we put that in the right bar? Now, it says here, borderline cases go to the bar on the right. That is not a hard and fast rule. That's just a choice. 
you can't count it twice. So you can't put one in each bar. You got to make a choice. This particular author decided on the right, but they don't have to be on the right. <clears throat> okay, you can go left. It's just, <clears throat> excuse me. Once you uh, make a choice, you have to stick with it. Does that make sense? Questions? <clears throat> Notice that the histogram bars do touch. <clears throat> when there's no count, you leave a space. So between 30 and 32.5. And 32.5 and 35, there just happened to be none. And then back in the 35 to 37.5 bar, we have one again. So how many burgers had less than five grams of saturated fat? Well, you find five, which we know is right here. Five exactly goes to the right, so I don't have to worry about that. So how many have less than five? Eight. Eight, that's the count. How many have less than 30? Two. What do you get two? All of these are less than 30. Oh, doesn't that say 30 or more? Uh, sorry, I apologize, I misread it. Don't how, apologize. Many, how many of them have 30 or more? Two. Mm, it looks like this is one. One, yeah. Yeah, one. Wow. Wow, I am full of mistakes today. Uh, oh. Angela, today be, that is unacceptable. Why should today be any different? Okay, anyways, let's move on. So, are there any questions? <laughs> that was not very nice. I wasn't that's trying my to. best friend. Oh, I'm so Man. sad to hear that. Oh, I guess that's her second mistake. But okay, let's move on. All right, so who wants to watch me? Never a mistake. Oh, who wants to watch me and Arps dance when we were baby high schoolers? As interesting as that sounds, I'd like to finish the math first and then we can and then we can uh, and then we can watch. But yeah, that's a definite yes, I want to see that. Anyway, so yeah. Are you skipping chapter nine by chance? Uh, there is no chapter nine in my power. Oh. So yeah, we're not doing chapter nine. So here is another histogram of exactly the same data that we had before. How is this histogram different? The numbers are the frequency move. Well, I, I mean, switched. No. hold on. If it's the same data, then you can't change the outcomes, right? It's the same hamburgers, the same numbers as it was before. It's just like the bars are taking up five rather than one. Yes, exactly. The widths of the bars, the classes are wider. Math two. Wow, I'm so smart. Yes, no one said otherwise. Right. All right. So um, the widths are twice as wide, which means it's even worse than, a, well, I wouldn't say worse. I mean, it's a choice that you make for how wide the classes are. But in terms of your data, we have slightly less information than we had before. Because now between zero and five, we have eight. And between five and 10, we now have what, 16, 17, whatever this is. But because we combine two bars into one, obviously the bars get taller as a general rule. But what happens is, is that we are missing some more information because now we're lumping more of them together into one bar. So we're getting further and further removed from the dot plot. Which version do you prefer? I personally prefer this one because it's closer to a dot prop. Yeah, all eight could have five grams, right? We would never know. Well, actually they can't have five because five would go into the right one, but they can all have like 4.7, right? Remember borderline cases go to the right. So if they were all had five, technically they would be in this one. Crazy world we live in. Okay, so I like the first one because it's closer to a dot plot you get more precision for where the things lie <laughs> without- I like the, that one too, professor. Well, thank you for backing me up because nobody was saying anything. And I, I knew you worried. needed my my I, input. Oh, thank you. Patty, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Do you want an eight by 10, a picture of me? Angela has one. Can you sign it? Yeah. 
Okay. I'm actually going to be famous pretty soon. So. I would imagine so. And when you're really, really famous, I assume you've been making a lot of money too? Yeah? Yes, don't worry. You'll get a portion. Okay, okay. That, that's what I was worried. We can never forget your class, your math oh, 211 class. Thank you. Um, but you're not going to be rich and famous, Laura. She might. So I'm not really concerned with you right now. Oh, well, I'm just No, I'm asking if, if she won't forget her math 211 class. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you. That, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, let's keep going. So now we have what are called relative frequency histograms. A relative frequency histogram is very similar to a histogram. But rather than actually giving us the numbers themselves, the actual counts, the change that it makes is that it gives us the proportion in that bar. So if we look at the, the one here, how many um, hamburgers are in the first bar. Anyone recall from like 30 seconds ago? How many hamburgers are in the first bar? Five or something. Well, how high is the bar? Eight. Eight. So eight out of how many? How many were there all together? 27, was it? I don't think so. Five. 69. 69. So what is eight over 69? What is eight over 69? I asked you first. Point one one Point six. one one six zero. So notice that the height of the first column, point one one six zero, it's the proportion of hamburgers that fall in each bar. Not the actual amount, but the proportion. So it's really giving us the same information if we know the total number. What's the advantage of having a, um, what's the advantage of having a relative frequency histogram versus an actual frequency histogram? I ask myself that every day. No, I know, <laughs> I know. It's one of those questions that keeps you up at night, right? I know, I know. So what's the reason why I would have a relative frequency histogram versus an actual frequency histogram? If you want to know the percentage of what a portion of the whole, I don't know. Right, right. But my question is, why would I rather know that than the actual number? It's estimating. I don't know. No, it's not so much estimating. It's because if I want to compare two different histograms, that come from two different sizes, of course the numbers in one are gonna be very different than the numbers in the other. For example, if I said, um, if I said, you know, to get it political for a second, again, not going into people's personal preferences or opinions. But if I asked you to compare the number of Trump voters in Montana to the number of Biden voters in California, then which of those two is gonna be bigger? Trump voters in um, Montana or Biden voters in California? I'm thinking it's voters in California because there's a lot more people. Exactly, right? So there's so many more people in California. There's definitely gonna be more Biden voters in California than Trump voters in Montana. But does that mean that the percentage of one is bigger than the percentage of the other taking into account their individual populations? I don't no, know. The percentage could be bigger. Or it's well, like, or per capita kind or of. Per capita. Stuff. That's exactly per capita, the same basic idea. I don't think that's even a number very bad hand. That's 0. 0.1160. What's that blue number? It's point what? Okay, you know what? I won the best penmanship in second grade, Mrs. Morris's class. Okay, to this day, it is still my finest achievement. My finest achievement is my second grade best penmanship, okay? Don't knock my handwriting. Okay, so just so I know that I understood wow. what you were explaining. So you're saying that the relative frequency histogram is better than the previous one, only because if you're if you're comparing two uh, different uh, things, if you look at it by percentage, it's about the same? Well, I don't know if it's the same. I can't say it's the same, but it's a lot easier to compare two different histograms 
that come from two different populations of different sizes. Okay. Right. If I, if I look at the actual numbers, of course, the bigger population is going to have the bigger numbers, but the percentages might be a whole different story. So I can, I can, it's easier to compare that way. If you've taken chemistry, it's like the comparison between mass and density, right? Obviously a bigger object is going to have a bigger mass, but the densities might be equal where I divide by the volumes. It gives me a better way to compare two different samples. Sad boy hours. I don't know what that is. But anyway, you all some real, uh, you, guys just, you guys just talk weird. All right, <clears throat> so now, when examining graphical displays of quantitative data, we're gonna look for answers to the following question. First of all, always use units when applicable. Okay, always use units when applicable. So the histogram gives the age, of course, at which 315 dogs were diagnosed with diabetes. Very sad. Okay, so the first question is, what is the source of the data? Where did this data come from? Where did this data come from? Is there from Brazil? I'm sorry? From South, uh, Southern Brazil? Uh, yeah, it looks, like, it looks like some study that was done in Southern Brazil. Now, do you think, first of all, this is more of a sociological question, but do you think that age of diabetes in dogs should be correlated to uh, location? Is there a reason why in South Brazil dogs would get diabetes at a different age? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't really see why. Maybe in South Brazil, dogs are outside more or outside less, and therefore they're run around more or less. I don't know. I, I, I can't speak to that. Were you asking for, for the location or were you asking how they got their numbers? Uh, the source of the data, it wasn't really so much just a location. It was the entire thing. This whole thing here, Oh, is the okay. source of the data, right? This study that was done by A.G. Popol, okay, titled The Frequency of Endocrinopathies and Characteristics of Infected Dogs and Cats Out of Brazil, that was published in Acta Scientae Veterinae in 2016, volume number 44, probably maybe page 1379. I don't exactly know, you know, the format, but that would be the source of the data. So that way someone else can look it up and decide whether or not the study was done properly, or whether there was some flaw, or there were some details that are not obvious. You always want to consider the source of the information, right? If I get a study from the National Enquirer, I might not be so inclined to necessarily believe it versus another reputable source like, um, you know, Entertainment Weekly or something like that. Okay. Now, what are the variables and what are the cases? That is, what was measured and who or what was it measured on? So what are the variables in this example? Okay, what was it that was measured? What is changing from dog to dog? Uh, the diagnosis of diabetes. Not the diagnosis itself, but more specifically? The diabetes. Not, not the diabetes itself, but more specifically? Look at the x-axis. What is actually very age. age? The age at which the dogs got diabetes. Okay, so the variable is the horizontal axis uh, quantity, which is the age. What are the cases? Who? What was measured on? Dogs. The dogs themselves. So 315 cases where the variable of measurement was the age in years. Is this a histogram or a relative frequency histogram? Actual relative. relative? This is relative frequency. These are percentages, right? These are percentages. So for example, what percent of dogs got diabetes between nine and 10 years old? Uh, 
31%. Well, let's take a look. So this bar is the nine, nine year olds, right? So it looks like it would be what, six, a little under 16% of them? So maybe 15, because it's in between. Well, no, the way, the, way, the way I read this is the first bar is any dog that was between zero years old and one full year old. And the second bar is any dog from uh, first British. birthday to second birthday. So the, this would, these would be the one-year-olds, right? And these would be the two-year-olds because you have not, I don't really like the way this is made, but because I, I prefer to have the border specified. But it looks like this is up until age one. So these are the less than one-year-olds, the one-year-olds, the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds, and so on. Again, I don't really like the format of this one. I would prefer it to be like a left edge to right edge. Um, so basically I, how you like it, it would be 32, right? Well, no, I don't necessarily 32 because even no matter how you read it, each bar is one year, right? One bar is one year, correct? So if I said nine to 10, you can't use two bars to cover that unless you mean just turn nine to just about to turn 11. Is that what you, is that what you thought I meant from nine to 10? Yes. Then in that case, yeah, it would be 32%. So yeah, so again, maybe even my wording wasn't the greatest. Okay. Um, are there any unusual characteristics such as clusters or gaps or outliers here? Clusters are a bunch that are together, then a gap, and then more that are together. I don't see any clusters. I don't see any gaps. I don't see any outliers. This seems like a nice, normal, looking bell curve, right? Looks like a pretty reasonable structure, okay? Um, in this class, when we talk about the shape of a curve, we essentially mean one of three possibilities. Either it's skewed to the right, which means the tail's on the right side, skewed to the left, so the tail's on the left side, symmetric and normal, Symmetric means it's a mirror image and normal is like a bell curve or symmetric, but not normal. It's still a mirror image, but it's not a bell curve. So those are the four basic shapes that we're gonna be dealing with. So when we say, what's the shape? You can say, oh, it's skewed right, it's skewed left, it's symmetric normal, or it's symmetric not normal. Where is the distribution centered? What is the center of the distribution? Well, this one seems to be about here or so, 10 years old, give or take. Right, it's a good measure of center, where half are to the left and half are to the right if we're dealing with the median, or it's a nice balance point if we're dealing with the mean. So right around here is a center. Again, we're not being exact, just it's a general idea of where the center is. What can you say about the variability in the, var in the values? How spread out are they? It looks like that the average is around 10 years old, but it could be anywhere from when they're born to about 17. It looks to be about a 17 year spread. We have some dogs who get diabetes right away. We have some dogs who don't get diabetes till they're 17 years old. So the spread looks to be about 17 years. And then if you do see patterns, you might look for explanations. Okay, I don't see any special patterns here like gaps or clusters or outliers. It's just a basic curve. You know, dogs tend to get it around 10 or 11 years old. Some dogs go less, some dogs go more, but the majority of them are right around the center. It doesn't really require much explanation when everything is nice and how you expect. So here's another a situation. This one is certainly not normal. It's not symmetric. What will be the shape of this one in front of us? <clears throat> would that be skewed left or skewed right? Skewed right? This is skewed to the right, tails all the way in the right side, correct? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. When you mean skewed, do you mean, because I thought this was left, how come it's right? Because the tail is on the right side. Oh, okay, so it's skewed. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Skewed to the right, right? The tail goes up and then the skew comes from the right. If the tail was not there, it would be a nice curve and the tail is what skews it, okay? That's okay. how we 
interpret skewness. So the histogram shows the violent crime rate for the 368 California cities with at least 10,000 residents. So for example, it looks like each bar represents a width of how much? Each bar is a width of how much? A hundred. About a hundred, right? Actually, exactly a hundred. Because what we have here is 500. So one, two, three, four, yeah. So each one is a hundred. So that's zero to a hundred. And that's zero to 200. And then we have 300 and so on. Hopefully you can read that and you don't insult my penmanship again. Okay, but we have 100, 200, 300, 400, and so on. Okay, Ooh, one second, let me finish that. There we go, okay. I appreciate that. So how many of the 368 cities had a crime rate of less than 100? Thank you, Yusenia. That's so sweet. I, I don't know how anyone could um, could really survive under that kind of um, all those kind of accolades, but I'll, I'll manage. So, how many of the three hundred sixty eight cities had a crime rate under a hundred? Thirty five. About thirty five. No, it's not twenty. Twenty's here. 30s here, this oh, about, about 35, 35. So. About 35 of them. Oh, sorry, approximately 35. Now, Los Angeles has a violent crime rate of 719 per 100,000 residents. Which bar would that land in? 80? No, no, which bar? There's all, which of these oh. bars would it land in? The first one, the second one, the third, which bar would it land in? Past 500. The eighth one? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one here? Yeah. Well, this is 600 here. This is 700. 700. So between that and... Between this and 800, right? Yeah. So 719 falls in this one. How many other cities fall in the same one approximately? Fifteen. Uh, about 15. Okay, that, that certainly seems like a reasonable value. Well, how'd you get 15? Well, because the height is 15. Right, what, did you, what was your question again? How many cities fall in that bar? Okay, I see what you. So it looks like about fifteen. Okay. You realize we can't see blue on blue, right? <laughs> I don't know how to change the color. Uh, Google it. I'm not googling it. Just write your own bar then. Anyways, so here. No, they just laughed at you. Yeah, that's okay. I get laughed at a lot, so I'm used to it. All right, so here are the violent crime rates for the 86 California cities with 90,000 or more residents. This one was over 10,000 residents, so there were 368 cities of over 10,000 residents. And here are the 86 cities with 90,000 or more residents. Oakland has the highest crime rate. Estimate this rate. What is the crime rate in Oakland? Approximately. About 30%? Uh, 30%? Uh, no. I'm not sure where you're looking. Oh, it's 400. No. Wait, are we doing, is it 300? No. I'm confused now okay. because the tallest one 
is fifteen hundred. How much? For like fourteen ninety nine or something. One, two, three, you pick, four. You pick, five. you pick the middle of the box. Fourteen fifty. You don't know where in the box it is, so you assume it's in the middle. Oh, I see. I went for the tallest blue. I know what you were doing. You know, too much blue in the page. I get that. Okay, but the issue here is that the bar represents the number of cities. Oakland is just one of those cities. It's the one with the highest crime rate. That's the highest x-axis value, which puts it in this box here along with something else. Because it looks like there's two in this box, but I don't know what the other city is. Probably like, you know, Fresno. I don't know. Is Fresno bad? I don't even know what Fresno is. Is it bad, Fresno? No, it's great. Okay. Cool. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so... Maybe dirt, but there's a lot of it. Wow. My hometown, kind of. Well, town. Cow, cow town? Yeah. There's lots of cows yeah. there. I live in Farmersville. It's like 45 minutes from Fresno. <laughs> That's where you are right now? Yes. Oh, I just made it up because it's the only city I can think of that wasn't Los Angeles off the top of my head. Yeah. So I wasn't insinuating anything. Okay. So, <laughs> at the... At this point, we've done dot plots and we've done histograms, and now it's time to do stem plots. So while the histogram can display an enormous number of values, the exact values are not shown. For fewer values, a stem plot, also called a stem and leaf plot, can preserve the exact values and can be made relatively quickly. Here is the stem plot for the 69 hamburgers that we've been dealing with for this entire chapter. You'll notice you have these numbers to the left. They're called the stems. And then you have a vertical line. Their vertical line is kind of broken, but usually the vertical line goes straight through. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Got a problem. Hold on. I'm going to draw a line. Cheater. Yeah. Beat that. Okay. So, what we have is a stem plot. Do you need help? No, I'm good, Angela. Thank you. I don't need help. I mean, yeah, I can use a little help, but not, not on this. You still need help changing the color of the ink. No one asked you. Okay, anywho, so <laughs> the question is, this zero as a stem and three as a leaf stands for what? What number is zero followed by a three? Three. How about zero in the next three? Three. Zero in the next three? Three. Three. Zero and four. Four. One and five. Six. Fifteen. Fifteen. Two and three. Twenty-three. Three and five. Five. So what we're doing here is we're putting the first number on the left, and that's the first number for everything in the row. So zero, three, 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 four, 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 five, 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 six, six, and so on. That way we don't have to keep writing every number in its entirety. The leaves are matched with the stem. We have the stem zero occur twice, just like the stem one and the stem two and the stem three, because we break up the leaves into zero to four and five to nine. Zero to four and five to nine. Zero to four and five to nine. Zero to four and five to nine and so on. So Dave's single cheeseburger from Wendy's has 13 grams of saturated fat. Circle it. Which is the Dave's Wendy's single cheeseburger located? First two? No, that's this one. The first one. And then, yeah. All right. It's the 13, the one, three. Oh. Right. 13 grams. That's this one. 
add a burger to the plot that has 34 grams of saturated fat, where would a 34 gram hamburger go? The three that has nothing next to it. And what would I put here? A four. four. Excellent. So if I want to add 34, I would just put a four there in the three row. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Yes. Yep. So this table shows the number of calories in McDonald's and Burger King burgers. Make a back to back stem plot and compare them. So if I make a back to back stem plot, first I have my two vertical lines. And then let's see what I have. Here's McDonald's or the top half. So I have a stem of a two and then a another actually I don't need I don't need to break it up this time because there's not a lot in each one. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. We'll do McDonald's on the right and we'll do Burger King on the left. So McDonald's has a 24 a 29 a 52, a 53, a 72, and a 75, where I'm not writing the last zero, but it's implied. So 240, 240, 290, 290, and so on. Burger King has a 220, a 270, a 630, a 750, an 850 and a 1040. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like the placeholders or something? Well, no. I mean 20, this is 2220, that's 270, that's 240, that's 290. The first digit gives you the heading, and the other digits give you the what comes next. Ugh. David's tired, so we'll call it a day. <laughs> Wait, what are you blaming me for? Because you're the one who yawned so loudly that they heard it three rooms over. What do you want me to say? It's it not was muted. Oh, I wasn't muted at all, not on my end. Professor, can you go back to that uh, example, the hamburgers and Burger King? Sure, what's up? Okay, when you did the line and you did 240, the the numbers in the middle of the line, those are the numbers in the beginning. And then whatever you put on the right or left is the second number. That's right. And then what about the third number, if you had a third number? Well, if you have more than that number, more than two numbers that you have to worry about, then only the last number is the leaf. That's always the case. Only one number can be the leaf and all the other numbers will be the stem. Okay. Okay. So, so if I had, for, if I, yeah. For instance, if it was 241 for McDonald's, we would have just left it like that. We wouldn't have written the one. So if it was 241 for McDonald's, this would be very difficult because then the zero and the one would have been the last, would have been the leaves. And I'd have to have 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, all the way through 104. And I'd have just too many stems. Right, so I would probably round to the nearest tens okay. and do it this way. Make sense? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so we finished chapter 10, but I know that you guys didn't forget that there was going to be a quiz today. So I'm going to put up quiz number four right now. I already have it made on chapter seven. And let's plan for another quiz next week. Um, so what chapter should we have it on? Eight or 10? 10. ten. Okay, well, you did what we did today. 10, okay. So um, on Thursday, I'll put up the solutions for 10 so that you can look over them, but I recommend doing as much as you can prior to that. 
and I will put I up see, a quiz. I don't see quiz four. When is? No, it's not up yet because I haven't oh. posted it yet. But I have it written. I just When's the it. quiz due? It's due by class time on Thursday. Got it. So you'll have slightly under 48 hours to do it. Okay, so quiz four is due Thursday at 2 p.m. And then we're gonna have quiz five next week as well on chapter 10. Crazy. Asenia. When do you wanna do the I quiz? I cannot get anything past you. Look, I have to write this down. <laughs> so I wanna be sure that my dates are right. That's fine. You got your yellow post. I feel you. <laughs> no. It's not in my classroom, but I oh, hope. Riley, you gotta be carrying them all the time. I'm gonna write it down right now, like <laughs> leave it up there. Yes, David. It'll take you like nine or ten hours to get the next quiz up. So Can it'll be do up it? uh, as soon as it posts. Can we do it during the break? What break? Can we just we have a break? It Ooh, was I thought we were done with class. What break? It wasn't meant for you. Oh. <laughs> I got nothing. Okay, we're done. I'm going to stop recording.